This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at VAChamber.com. Virginia hospitals and health systems provide jobs. They support our economy and promote public health. Local hospitals are always open to help people with unexpected health needs. Having a stable health care network is vital. Virginia hospitals are our lifeline. It's amazing what my students with special needs can accomplish. Their pride is priceless. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association. Because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. week in Richmond and a very special welcome to two of the newest senators in the Senate of Virginia, Senator Monty Mason, who served a term in the House, elected in 2016, and Senator Mark Peek, elected in 2017 <laughs> in a special <laughs> election. Our viewers are seeing this show now in the time between Sine Die here at the Capitol and the Reconvene Day and really are interested in your telling them about some of the issues that that you think were important to your districts, to the Commonwealth, uh, ones that succeeded or ones that didn't. So, Monty, with your two years more seniority, we'll start with <laughs> you right. and, yeah, right. and, then, and then the two of you just yeah. go back and forth yeah. and tell Sure, yeah. sure. Well, yeah, I very much enjoyed uh, the experience in the Senate, um, but this whole session is budget, 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 you know, with right. a $1.2 billion shortfall. Um, there have been a lot of decisions that have been based upon that. And fortunately, from the time the governor proposed his budget in December to the end of session, the revenue forecast got better and changed and so freed up some money um, that we were able to do. But a lot of decisions this year were simply based upon the fact that there wasn't money there to make them. And so I, th I think we'll have hopefully a better budget picture as we go to the next biennium budget um, and have more opportunities. But we are able to do some things and restore some pay raises that are sorely needed. Um, so I think the, by the time we're all said and done, the picture will be good, um, mm -hmm. but we've got a lot of work to do going into next year. Mark? Uh, first, I'll say I, I was elected January 10th, the night before session started. Two of the first people that I met, I showed up the next morning, were Monty's parents because <laughs> yeah, Monty right. was getting That's sworn right. in. They live in, my, in Farmville in my district, and so I got to see them, and so that was a, a nice welcome to the Senate. and. Uh, so I've, I've started cold and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I'm way behind. But most importantly for, for what I was focused on when I was running were the uh, pay, uh, pay increases for the troopers and right. deputies. Uh, my district's very rural. We have nine counties, so a lot of sheriff's departments. And there have been a lot of reports that the deputies were some of them, many of them, with family of four, eligible for food stamps based on yeah. their salaries, and state troopers, similar stories. So I was extremely pleased that we were able to boost trooper pay and boost uh, the deputies. So that's, that's been my focus in this term, and I'm, I'm happy that it looks like that those things will get taken care of. So. so money moving from the House to the Senate, uh, one term in the House, how was that transition? It, it was fine. There's some procedural differences, um, you know, debating the bill and voting on it at the same time versus in the House you debate it on the second read and then vote the next day on third. Um, and more work is done in full committee in the Senate. So in the House, you, you, you are involved in issues based on mostly your subcommittee's work, um, which limits you with the number of people there. 
Um, because I have three committees in the Senate, and I think you have really good committee assignments as well, You're, I, there are a lot of new issues that you start that, that I never worked on before. I'm, I'm really excited to be on the Agriculture, uh, Conservation, and Natural Resources Committee, but that's a whole series of issues that it's great for my district, but a whole series of issues that I've never dug into before, and right. boy, right. i got a lot of work to do to come up to speed. Right. And that's a great committee, and I'd like to have been on that committee because <laughs> my, my district is really rural, and a lot of farmers, a lot of logging, and agricultural resources, so that's a great committee. But I'm, on, I'm, I'm a practicing attorney for a living, and I saw Monty was one of the first people I saw once I finally was assigned to a committee, and he just had a, a from his work base, he's obviously developed a niche in uh, computer fraud, computer uh, safety and had numerous bills that, that came up and you know, he's a Democrat, I'm a Republican and nobody paid any attention to that. These were right. nice bipartisan <laughs> right. uh, computer computer issues. Looks like you've got a good niche in that area and one of the other new senators, Lionel Sproul, I just remember noted in one of the early committees we passed his bill right through and he, he said, oh my gosh, 20 years in the House of Delegates, I never got a bill through. Right. And I think his first couple uh, just sailed through our, our committee. So I think what I've been pleased with is we're looking at the quality of legislation. Is it addressing a real problem? And that's what we look at. And is it needed? And then if it is, then we passed it through. That's, a, that's right. I look, for, I look forward to working with Mark because he is representing my old hometown and I work with James Edmonds a lot who uh, represented it in the House and, and you know he makes a good point. A, a small percentage of what's done up here is R&D. The rest of it is very regional, very um, groups and interests that work together. Uh, he and I have already talked about the opportunity to work with and help Longwood University I mean, so there are just so many like kind areas. Some of my friends I grew up with in his district are family farmers today. Um, so I have that background going to the committee. And although the natural resources side is probably a little more topical for me in my district. Um, so I, I was glad when we got the opportunity to do this together. And I look forward to working with him on a go forward. I didn't know about the connections, family connections, and even growing up in, the, in Mark's district. But I tell you, the two of you are illustrating what I wish that more people around the Commonwealth knew, and that is what they see in those 30-second food fights, as they may be called, is only a tiny part of what really happens here. Well, I hope Monty will be throwing stuff at me next. <laughs> yeah, it, was a, it was a quiet session. I didn't, have, I didn't know enough to, to really irritate him. But I think, I think I would say I've been really surprised because my first session, I, it seems to have gone very smoothly, very little controversy, dealing with the budget, trying to take care of state employees, troopers, deputies, teachers, and just making sure the budget worked out. Everything else it has appeared to, a lot of the controversial stuff hasn't reached us in the Senate. And, and you know, you, you disagree on policy matters, but you also know tomorrow you have to turn around and work with the <coughs> same people. Right. So, you know, so building that relationship, one of the most conservative members of the House of Delegates has two girls just younger than my girls. I've got a box of clothes in my car for him today. <laughs> you know, so it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that I may not have voted for several of his bills, but we're friends. We work together. It's, it, it's a whole different level of relationship when you're trying to, when you're doing that. And, you know, he talked about expertise. I really like the Citizens Legislature. You know, having a lawyer on courts of justice is a great idea. Um, I was a non-lawyer on courts of justice in the House, which was really hard, but you bring a different perspective. And so it, it, it's tough. It's a lot packed into a short period of time. Uh, but developing the relationships and looking to people's expertise is, is the way to get, to get along. And following that, and I don't know if I was talking with you or somebody else, but it was, it was last week, and we had some bill come up, but... It might be COPM, so you've got some insurance folks who sell health insurance. You've got doctors on one side. You've got people in the hospital administration. We have just a great variety of people who are representing the entire Commonwealth that bring a perspective from each side of the issue, and it, you can really learn a lot. You need to listen. You listen to other people's areas of expertise, and it's very helpful. We have a very diverse group of, uh, of people. 
a complex issue. Yes. Now, since you don't have a, another election until 2019, I, 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 I can really ask you a question that I can't ask delegates as easily, and that is, what are the issues that, that you see going forward prior to the 2018 session that you think are either important for your district, your constituents, or important statewide that, that you think you'll be, you'll be working on as, as uh, two of the 40 in the Senate? Well, I've done a lot of computer trespass work, um, so I'll continue those things. Some of the things like that the public doesn't know so much about, you know, but right. figuring out where we go forward. A lot of what we're doing in the next election and in the next couple of years is going to be reacting to what's going on in Washington. And there's a lot of uncertainty <clears throat> there. Fortunately, we're more consistent in Richmond, but we're going to have to figure out it could be very beneficial for my district and our area from a defense contracting standpoint. Um, from a health care standpoint that we haven't been able to figure out in Richmond for the past few years, it could be entirely in flux. Um, so reacting to what the, the federal government is going to be doing over the next year, I think is going to set a lot of the tone towards what we focus on and how we have to react in Richmond. Mm -hmm. And I would say I expect COPN will continue to be a major issue. It was apparently it was been debated forever. They really tried to get something done at the end of last session. It hoped something would happen this year. Nothing has happened, and I, I just know we're going to be hearing a lot about that. That will be a main issue. And then I think, as Monty said, what's going to happen with Obamacare, Medicaid, Medicare is going to be block funded from the federal government. I think once these things play out in the next five, six months from the federal government, we'll know what's facing right. us come 2018. Right. Yeah, really, really well, any number of those could affect the next budgeting cycle yes, that, no that, that the money committees along with the governor be working on. And one of the, again, one of the odd things about the Commonwealth of Virginia, which hopefully our viewers know, is that an outgoing governor presents a budget and the new governor comes in and is almost in the same position as legislators at that time trying to figure out to submit amendments to the budget. It's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily the best budgeting cycle that, that we're on. No, not at all. I asked John Chichester once, who was former Senate Finance Committee chairman, if there was a way we could make the change. And, and you know, even have a one year that gets us on cycle. And he said he just thought there was no way an incoming administration could be elected in early November and have a budget ready to go to the legislature and have the team in place by mid-December, mid to end of December. He just didn't think logistically it could be done. But it does put a new administration in a weird position. Right. I mean, the McAuliffe administration didn't even get a chance to opine on the budget yeah. the last year. Now, they could send down administration, but the House Appropriations Committee took the lead on what was going to be done so that you find yourself in a weird situation. Right. Well, certainly what, what Senator Chichester said puts the other side in a good view that there is, that a new administration could have difficulty doing it in that short period of time. Absolutely. So, and that, yeah, it, there isn't much time to no. come up and it, you talk about something very complicated and just having gone through a whole campaign, you just really don't have time to focus on those issues of actually running a government, which the budget does. So, that's but one of the hard things as a new person is to learn to get, figure out how you get your arms around it. Yeah, I mean, right. this year there wasn't much money, so but our Senate yeah. amendments to the budget were 157 pages, and you get it on Tuesday, which Monday or Tuesday, mm -hmm. Monday, and it or Sunday. Um, crossover is Tuesday, so Monday and Tuesday are your busiest days for voting on and acting upon legislation. Yeah. So you think, wow, i got a break now. No, you have to vote on the budget on Thursday. <laughs> yeah, so you've got 48 right. hours to pour right. through 158 yeah. pages and see what you like, what you don't like, right. what impacts you and your district. It, yeah. It's tough to get used to. And, yeah, there's not a whole lot of downtime. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a rapid, rapid fire. But it, it's everybody on all sides of the aisle have just been a pleasure to deal with. And the staff that they have for the clerks, and uh, staff, just everybody's very easy to work with, and 
trying to get us the information we need. But I just right. got to figure out how to understand how it. To digest. Well, that's yeah. probably a good way to wrap it up with your last two comments. Yeah. And we would hope for you and all your colleagues that you get a little bit of downtime <laughs> back in your districts. And in the meantime, we look forward to having you back again another time on This Week in Richmond. Thank you. Thanks, man. Anytime. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm delighted to welcome Delegate Matt Ferris to This Week in Richmond. And Delegate Ferris, on all the floor speeches that were made, uh, most of them very serious, some of them with humor, all of them trying to create a point about a bill. I think hands down the one that you made on the hunting dogs is, is ranked as, as one of the top ones for the 2017 session. And for our viewers who haven't been among the few thousand who've been on YouTube to see it, we wanted you to tell them how you came up with this idea and then tell them, if you will, I think the story is about a five or six minute story. We'd like to hear it again. Well, um, of course, as, as most people know, it was a very contentious subject here in Richmond this, this session. And uh, it was um, a bill, a piece of legislation that was championed by a very uh, respected gentleman, the Speaker of the House, Bill Howe. And uh, so uh, it was something that I was very passionate about. My family and I uh, enjoy hunting with dogs. And the majority of people in my district uh, or, or participants in that sport, and right, it was right. it was uh, uh, <clears throat> it was expected from my district for me to to speak against the speaker of the house on the house floor. <laughs> so I had to uh, I had to arrive at something that could be uh, funny, but understanding to everybody about what happened and and, and how things could uh, under his legislation could cause hard feelings between neighbors and and uh, just was was contentious and I had to explain that so uh, I had I had it uh, I had my speech planned to be a, a, a much larger hunt but then I had to cross too many landowners in a small <laughs> location right, and, right. and uh, so it, it just worked out great the way it uh, all came together and it and it made a point. Uh, Ms. Shar, it, of course, the clerk of the Senate, is very impromptu. Wants everything done exactly right. And and uh, she, uh, if she thought somebody was doing something wrong, she would definitely scold them for it. And so, uh, and most everyone here understands that. So the uh, the way it played out, it really resonated home to I think everybody. How. Uh, with no intentions of of uh, causing hard feelings that, that this leg piece of legislation could cause hard feelings between friends and neighbors. So um, it was uh, it all started with a little rabbit hunt at the governor's mansion because he and his wife had planted a garden to create uh, a fresh fruit uh, to, to stop there from being a fresh food desert in Richmond. Right. And so the governor was uh, telling me about his plan, planting this, and which he did. He and his wife did last year plant, a, or two years ago, they planted a nice garden over there and they've been maintaining it. And so the governor uh, expressed to me, which of course is all part of the tale, that the rabbits were eating his garden up. And so Buddy Fowler, who has rabbit beagles and also hunts with dogs here in the uh, and the member of the house, he and I took his beagles over to the governor's mansion to uh, hunt. And the governor had invited uh, Delegate Simon and Delegate Lopez. They're from Alexandria, Northern Virginia. And um, they, uh, <clears throat> one of them was in the military and the other one hunts. But their, their constituents expect them to, uh, and they do a really good job of, of speaking on the floor against the you know the use of guns and right. and everybody uh having the ability to carry guns and so uh 
when we got there to the governor's mansion, they were there because the governor wanted them to uh, see how things were, uh, you know, guns were used right, hunting. Right. And so uh, he'd also invited the speaker because the speaker was really involved in hunting with dogs at this time. And, right. and uh, yeah. <clears throat> of course, Todd Gilbert mm -hmm. has championed uh, the uh, Second Amendment for a long time and last year when we had a really um, involved discussion about guns and reciprocity. Of course, Todd was involved with that a lot and the governor thanked him in his State of the State, uh, State of the Commonwealth address. He right. thanked Todd yes. for helping him. So uh, he invited Todd to come over on a hunting trip and then the uh, the uh, Southwest Virginia gang, the Kilgore gang, heard about the hunting trip, and they wanted to go. <laughs> and so uh, uh -huh. we we got after a rabbit, and the rabbit went down to the uh, went down to the past uh, Ralph Northam's office, and and uh, he ran down by the uh, DCJS office and came up, started back across the Capitol grounds, and the Kilgore gang shot at him and missed the rabbit. <laughs> And when they missed the rabbit, he, the rabbit took for cover and went around the Capitol building over on the Senate side where uh, Ms. Shaw looks after uh, things over there. And she got upset because the dogs come over there. Uh, and, of course, she wasn't really mad with us. She was mad with Bill Stanley, who's always got dog and cat bills and is certainly a cantankerous <laughs> figure on the floor sometimes. Right. And so uh, mm -hmm. the moral of the story was that uh, because the Kilgore gang missed the rabbit and because Ms. Shaw was not, uh, didn't like Bill Stanley, she got mad at Bill Howe and the governor for letting the dogs run over on her property. And uh, so we all got fined, mm -hmm. which was the... Uh, intent of the legislation and I, I understand that there's a uh, there are some people that really do uh, neglect it, the property rights of others with hunting with dogs uh, but most of the time the uh, ethical good good hunt hunters which is 99 percent of the people if they know that somebody like Miss Shaw doesn't want their dogs on her property they do everything they can to keep them from that so, uh, but you know, it's it's tough to, when when a a hunt is involves a, a a wild animal and some dogs. It's hard to control where that animal goes when the dogs are chasing them, and uh, so uh, that that's kind of the moral of the story. And I hope everybody enjoyed it, and I hope everybody got the point, and uh, was was glad that the. Uh, Discussion. I'm not going to take credit for the bill not passing, but I, I'm glad the discussion uh, for the side of the dog hunters was successful. And for for viewers who maybe didn't follow that issue, we not only thank you for telling the the story that you told on the floor of the house, but the the bill failed by one vote. And, yes, sir. And, and coming out, out of the house, so it was right. it was really close, and it was it was a lot of. Uh, a lot of discussion and, and uh, um, a lot of mind changing, I'm sure, in the weeks leading up to to uh, how they would take that vote because uh, hunting with dogs is is uh, done over most of the state, but uh, Northern Virginia, of course, and in, in, in the Virginia Beach area, and here in Richmond, where so many of our, our delegates come from it's not done and so um, it's a certainly certainly a, a very good property rights argument but uh, there's also the side that, that I tried to express that that it's not not intentional when it's done and it's just uh, just was going to cause more grief and hard heartache between neighbors right and and as so often happens it, it was more of a regional vote than, than anything else, exactly what you said. Yes, sir. Now, I, I, I imagine folks are going to be wanting you to tell that story to other places, <laughs> and I even uh, 
heard from someone in your staff that folks had called from Mississippi and other places, and just uh, that story is out there. And it, and I think it il, il, you what you did illustrates how you can effectively argue against a bill and use some good humor. And I'm getting the signal that our time's up. But Delegate Ferris, thank you for retelling the story. Yes, sir. And for being on this week yes, in sir. Richmond. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank I you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. For jobs, the economy, and public health, Virginia Hospitals, our lifeline. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.